Hey and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. And today, we're looking at Blood Drive. I just invited Jim to suck it. And I am cordially inviting all of you to a special convention. A, a Lonely Hearts convention. All right, Blood Drive was written by Brent Forster and directed by Randall Einhorn. Blood Drive first aired on March 5th, 2009, and was viewed by 8.6 million people, and currently has a flat eight out of 10 on IMDb. More on that later, guys. So the Blood Drive trivia is, in this episode, Jim pretends to be- Michael Scott, manager. Hi, how are you? He's done this before. What was the last episode that Jim pretended to be Michael? Answer the trivia first, spot out the Easter egg, and or leave the best emoji sequence summing up next week's episode, and you'll get your name in that field guide. That makes this season five's Valentine's Day episode. Really shoving our faces in it this year. But we're gonna get more to that later with some history on Valentine's Day, what Michael's mystery woman represents, and while not many new connections happen in this episode, there are some interesting IMDb connections. And be warned, there may be spoilers for the series ahead. So with that, let's get desperate. I understand nothing. Okay, so a little bit about Valentine's Day. Occurring on February 14th across the US and many other countries, flowers, candies, gifts, and other gestures. Let's get you home and you are gonna get the best sex of your life. Are exchanged between loved ones in the name of St. Valentine's. But who was that? Kind of like St. Nicholas being a concoction of folklore and loosely based on a couple of real historical figures, St. Valentine's Day is actually shrouded in a little bit of mystery. We know that February has long been celebrated as a month of romance, though, and I literally don't know why I know this, the month where the most babies are born is September. So that means while we celebrate February as the month of love, the most productive loving month is January. The more you know. Regardless, most scholars do agree that Valentine's Day became a way for the church to Christianize an existing pagan holiday, which was kind of par for the course back then. In this specific case, it was Lupercalia. The Catholic Church does acknowledge a few different real people named Valentine or Valentius. One of the legends comes from the third century in Rome, in which Emperor Claudius II outlawed marriage for young men, as the theory was that single guys made better soldiers than those who had earthly attachments. I can't even imagine. Oh. So this priest, Saint Valentine, would perform marriages for these young people in secret. Then Claudius found out and Wham, his kappa is detated from his head. Another legend had different people named Valentine doing things like helping Christians escape from Roman prisons. And there's even a legend about a Valentine's who was behind bars, who had gotten to know a secret lover on the outside, but before his death in that prison, he wrote a letter signed to her from your Valentine. Aww. There's a lot of death surrounding Valentine's Day lore. Really, Jim? On Cupid's birthday? Yeah. While Lupercalia was dedicated to the Roman god of agriculture, Faunus, today we mostly celebrate Valentine's Day with imagery of Cupid, who has his roots in the Greek god of love, Eros, with Cupid being his Latin counterpart. Eros was most known to play with the emotions of gods and of men, using his golden arrow to incite love or keep people away. And say, I'm in love, I was hit by Cupid's sparrow. Funny little bird, but he gets the job done. It wasn't until well after 300 something AD that we started to know him as the chubby baby angel thing. Now it's just a stupid baby. Today, Valentine's Day is really just Black Friday for the flower, the card, and the gift industry. It's a really divisive holiday. We celebrate love, but love is difficult to celebrate when you don't currently have any reason to celebrate love, leading to the whole plot of this episode. If you guys insist on having your own private little love fest, we do that none of us can be a part of. Mm -hmm. You can't be a part of our relationship, Michael. Then? Michael has this random connection with Jenny from the league. You're cute. What? You're done. And upon waking up, he finds her glove. Though in fairness, Michael might just be romanticizing things here. I don't romanticize. N no. Cause you know, that might not be her glove. Anyway, the whole setup here is remarkably close to 2001's Serendipity a movie that made me crush real hard on Kate Beckinsale. I'm so, I just, I have to tell the truth. I'm telling them the truth. No, you're so much better than Kate Beckinsale. I'm Serendipity made me a huge fan of John Cusack. And the setup for that film is that the whimsical Beckinsale has a serendipitous connection with John Cusack. After their evening together, she decides if it's meant to be, the universe will cross their paths again. And thus the rest of the movie plays out like a traditional rom-com. It's fine, I liked it. Not just because of Kate. 
You don't deserve her. Thanks, Michael. But Michael isn't the only one who strikes out in this episode. So, Eric, you mentioned before that you are in tool and die repair, right? Meredith recently had a total hysterectomy, so that's sort of a repair. Kevin, on the other hand, despite himself, actually does have some success here. Good Valentines. Lynn is portrayed by Lisa K. Wyatt, and there's an interesting office connection here. A year after this episode aired, she'd go on to play Peggy in 2010's The Crazies. And she's crazy, which is interesting, but, and spoiler for this mediocre horror movie that's over 10 years old, uh, she's put down by none other than Timothy Oliphant, who would be taking on the role of Danny Cordray that same year. But this Lonely Hearts Club conference meeting is incredible. Angela, you had two sets of different men actually duel over you? I guess I have. But maybe one of the saddest and cringiest stories is on his honeymoons. So he's just knocking them off one at a time. I think today he's hot air ballooning and later he's got a couple's massage. Okay, I actually found this archived site from 2009, which was an alt reality blog that Andy was keeping up for his reception. I'm gonna put the link in the description. It's not easy to navigate, but this one page was a lot of fun. Exactly. Eh. Yeah. Oh, here we go. And this might be dumb, but Kelly references Enchanted. This is like a modern day Enchanted. It's like a fairy tale. And that's an odd reference because Amy Adams portrayed the lead character in that film and is our purse peddler in season one. Also in the same sequence, this is said. Is somebody after you? Why do you always go to that? Has anyone ever been after anyone in this office? And I guess everyone forgot about this. Sounds good. Hey, help her! I also thought it was great that Stanley was present for the Lonely Hearts meeting, even though, you know, He's married. Uh, oh, I feel so woozy. I just. Oh. But let's talk about this blood drive more during the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. I can't decide if a story about Michael trying to fill his heart on Valentine's Day and then framing that around this blood drive is genius or a little too on the nose. With blood being pumped by the heart and the heart being the symbol for love. I don't know what you guys can decide. I'm sure I'll get back to it during the ratings. When you think about how different blood types react to other blood types, the metaphor for this episode starts to become a little bit more clear. And if you need a refresh on high school human biology, is what I'm here for. Humans have different blood types. These blood types are based on the presence or absence of antigens, which are basically little signal flares for your immune system. If you get the wrong blood type in you and it doesn't belong, it makes your immune system freak out. What's the procedure, Stay everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm. And why are there different blood types? No one really knows why. I mean, we know how you get different blood types. Want some meat? Oh, sure, a little piece. But we don't really know why. The leading theory at the moment is that it's an evolutionary response to combat plagues, case in point. And though high school Chris whined about this profusely, this topic in class always came along with having to memorize what blood types can be matched with others. If only high school Chris could see me now. So as we all remember, certain blood types can be matched with only certain blood types, A to A, B to B, and so on. And then there's AB, which can receive from everyone. And then there's O, who can give to everyone, but can only receive from O. And then it gets way more complicated when you add in positive and negatives, which I'm not gonna get into, because I don't think they have anything to do with the metaphor. Lonely people mixing with one another, breeding, creating an even lonelier generation. <laughs> You're not allowing natural selection to do its work. <laughs> Thus framing this story around the blood drive is intended to display how different types of people react to others. People like Jim and Pam and Bob and Phyllis have found their matches with each other, though I don't think they really react that well as couples. Then in this episode, we get to see how some reactions go well. Are you on email? Oh yeah. Cool. Okay, bye. Bye, Kevin. Some reactions are mismatch. Well, thanks for wasting my time tonight, idiot. And some flat out are rejections. Hi, is this the party? Yeah. So what's the message, right? So beyond this theme of types trying to react to each other, I think that the mere act of donating blood is intrinsically a selfless act. Gift of everlasting life. The transfer of my bodily fluids? No. Wow, that's a big needle. You don't get much in return for it. What you want, a cookie? 
Well, yeah, you do get a cookie. Pardon me, may I have a chocolate chip cookie? I gave blood earlier and I'm still feeling woozy. But in that selfless act, a person gives up a part of themselves in order to help someone else and potentially save a life. And could there be a better expression of what love is than self-sacrifice? And then what The Office does so well is wrap up this Valentine's Day episode with Michael not finding romantic love. Relationships, we don't need no stinking relationships but instead getting that self-sacrificial love expressed to him by those he considers his family. Michael, it's time. You know, you guys, you guys can get out. I'm, I'm gonna soldier on a little bit. Come on, we'll all go. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Which is really touching. And speaking of touching. So is Creed a vampire or is this a black market thing? Leave it in the comments. For now, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> right, so I was surprised. Eight out of 10 seems really low. And I don't wanna show my cards too early here, so let's just start with the cold opening. And if you don't remember, this is the one where Pam is ghosting the phone salesman guy. They have new phone systems now that can ring directly to a salesman or someone presses star and they go to accounting. Basically 95% of my job. Again, people will criticize Pam for literally everything. Yeah, deal with it, Pam. And from a business perspective, yeah, she's really not making a wise call here, but I get it. It's also funny. But I'd like to see a machine that puts out candy for everyone. Vending machine. So all good. Jim steps in to pretend to be Michael, and we get this nonsense for a full minute. Hey! Hey! Look, if this cold opening doesn't put a smile on your face, then. Hey! Michael's so happy playing with his staff, he loses all business sense and just goes with it. I'm giving this one a four out of five because it literally leaves me satisfied with a smile on my face. I'm, uh, let me go. Hey! As far as the episode itself, guys, I think this one's a sleeper. You did it. Ooh, wow, I was so nervous about this. I don't think I ate for three days. I really enjoyed myself with this episode. Look, I don't know if it's gonna end up on the top 10 list of all time, but as far as core Office episodes go, the ones where they're just doing Office stuff inside of the Office, and in this case, a blood van, it's a great filler episode. It shows a lot of heart and growth inside of Michael. Sometimes it's not about whether Cinderella gets her slipper back, but it's about the fact that the prince even picked up the slipper at all. And it's undeniably funny. What was that? That was funny. That was funny. And I hate to keep making this comparison, but I wonder if the lack of shock and awe is one of the reasons for the lower rating. Look, Forrester knows how to write for these characters. I'm giving it a four out of five. Okay, and if you haven't watched this episode recently, before you start blasting me in the comments, take a break from YouTube, go watch this episode with fresh set of eyes, look for the nuance, look for the fun, look for the cringe, then come back and tell me how wrong I am to give it such a high rating. That's totally fair. I'm just asking you, watch this episode, make sure it's fresh in your mind before you come at me. But that's just what I think about this episode. If you haven't, go check out our Patreon page. Uh, you can help support the channel. You can write mini reviews for future episodes. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.